For more medical podcasts, visit us at podlearn.org. Hi guys, my name is Andy. I'm one of the junior doctors working in Northumbria, and today I'm going to be talking to you about schistosomiasis. Now, we'll have a wee look at the background of the disease, the different schistosomal species, its life cycle, transmission, some of the acute and chronic symptoms it can cause, investigations, and finally the treatment of the condition. Now, schistosomiasis, or Bilharzia, named after Dr. Theodore Bilharz, who was the doctor that discovered the condition, is one of the most prolific tropical parasitic diseases. It results due to termitoid or blood fluke penetration into blood vessels of humans. It affects around 207 million people worldwide, with the main foci of the infection being within Africa, where 85% of those affected live. A strong correlation is shown with the condition with social economic status, with poor sanitation methods being the primary cause of disease spread. Now, there are a number of schistosomal species which exist that affect avian and mammalian creatures. However, there are only five species known to be infected to humans. These species differ in regards to the geographical eight regions in which they're found and also the anatomical regions which they affect. And the species which cause the most amount of disease and the two that we'll focus on are hematoboium or urinary schistosomiasis, which affect where the adult worms live um, in the perivesicular plexus, and manzoni, which affects the intestinal tract with the adult worms residing in the mesenteric plexus. The other species, japonicum, mekongye, and intercalatum, all affect the intestinal tract but have a more narrow foci of geographical spread. Now, if we look at this on the map, um, the green regions in Africa show where urinary and manzoni affect people. The kind of peach colour is purely where urinary affect and the brown regions are um, with the intestinal and manzoni effects. So as you can see, virtually every country in Africa is unfortunately affected by the condition. Now, life cycle and transmission of the parasite. So it begins when human excreta, which contains the schistosoma ova, is flushed out into water sources. Now these are usually slow moving streams or rivers, or more recently, man-made water sources such as reservoirs or irrigation canals. Once the ova contact the water, they hatch, releasing marsidia, which penetrate into various snail species, which act as an intermediate host. While in the snail, the marsidia asexually divide and release krakiri, which escape the snail into the water and when come in, they come into contact with humans, penetrate through the skin into the dermal veins and make their way to the liver. While in the portal veins, they mature into adolescent worms or schistosomulae. Now, the schistosomulae then have a choice of either making their final trip to the perivesicular plexus if they are urinary or hematoboeum, or into the mesenteric plexus if they're manzoni on the intestinal. While in these plexi, the adult worms live in permanent copulation and can create anything between 20 to 300 ova a day. Now, the ova either end up being deposited within tissues or are flushed out through urine or stool. And if poor sanitation abides, the ova are then washed back into water sources and we have completion and continuation of the life cycle. Now, if a human comes into contact with an avian species, so not one of the five that's been previously mentioned, then a transient dermatitis and itch can occur, known as swimmer's itch. And this usually spontaneously resolves. The other acute presentation is Katayama fever, which is an immune complex mediated response to the initial ova release. And this occurs about two to four weeks post exposure and results in really non-pacific symptoms of abdominal pain, fever, urticaria and diarrhea. And it's usually found in people who don't live in endemic regions, so pretty much travellers or backpackers to these regions. And the condition normally spontaneously resolves without treatment within a few weeks. Now, schistosomiasis is really a chronic disease. The adult worms, where they live either in the mesenteric or the perivesicular plexus, don't actually cause any symptoms. The worms take in proteins from their host and effectively become invisible, or to use a sci-fi term, 
cloak themselves against the immune system within the blood circulation. And really, symptoms only arise due to over-deposition in tissue and the subsequent immune and granulomatous reaction that the host provides. Now, depending where these over-deposit themselves can depend on the symptoms which arise. So if we, again, if we look at hematoboium or urinary schistosomiasis, the eggs are usually deposited within the ureters or the kidneys. And as a consequence, we get hematuria, dysuria, and hydronephrosis. It's also the most common cause of squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder within sub-Saharan Africa. The exact mechanism of how it causes um, squamous cell carcinoma is still unknown. It's thought that either the ova exposes the bladder epithelium to more carcinogens, or some of the nitronomases than chemicals that they over-release actually are carcinogenic in nature themselves. Now, manzoni, or again intestinal schistosomiasis, prevents, presents with symptoms that are very similar to inflammatory bowel disease. We get colitis, bloody diarrhea, pseudopolyp formation, abdominal pain, and anemia. Now, identification of disease is through light microscopy and identification of the ova. Now, to prepare urine for this, it can either be centrifuged or filtrated through microporous paper. And stool is prepared using the keto cats technique, which is when stool is spread over a slide and stained with methylene blue to make the eggs more visible. Now, for urinary schistosomiasis, microhematuria can also be detected using your, your, your dipsticks, although it's got quite a wide range with people being infected, either 41 to 100%, can also show signs of blood in the urine. More recently, urinary dipsticks have been used looking for specific antigens for the disease, such as central anodic and cathodic antigen, and it looks like this might be coming a more routine practice in the future. Now, identification of the ova lies in a definitive characteristic, which is a spine that's found on the egg. Now, this spine helps to anchor the egg against turbulent blood flow, a turbulent blood flow within the blood vessels. Now, in Manzoni, so you've got the S there, the spine is usually found in its side, a bit like a dorsal fin in a fish. Whereas in Hematobrium, so you've got the T in there, it's a terminal spine and kind of looks like the sting on a bee or a wasp. Treatment is very simple, and it's with a one-off dose of an anti-helfmic drug known as Praziquanto. The dose is 40 milligrams per kilogram, although it can be extrapolated using a dose pole for height, depending if the child is under five years old. The treatment works by paralyzing the parasite, flushing it out from its hiding place, where it becomes known to the immune system and is subsequently destroyed. Treatment can either be given to individuals who are positive for the disease, so you can identify ova in their stool or their urine, or also be administered um, via preventative chemotherapy. So these are groups which are at risk of getting infection. So school-aged children who have quite a lot of exposure with water sources, and also those that are occupational hazard, such as fishermen or rice paddy farmers. As well as treatment, preventative measures are also an important role to play in treating the condition. Education, so this is fundamentally in schools where children are taught that the disease is spread through contact with water sources. However, although a lot of individuals know this, they're unable to live their lives without contact with water, either through washing clothes or washing themselves. And subsequently, infection still occurs. Improved sanitation is also a very important topic. Effective plumbing, making sure that waste is disposed of away from water sources can result in a decreased exposure and continuation of the life cycle. Molluscicides have also been trialled in the past, although are a bit more controversial, as, as well as trying to rid um, the water sources of the snail intermediate hosts, subsequently they can also destroy other creatures and cause a bit more of environmental issues. So they're not commonly as used as your education, your sanitation. So if we look back again and compare our two main schistosomal species, our hematoboeum, um, with the urine, so we're talking about the urinary system. Adult worms live in the periversicular plexus. The eggs are usually deposited within the ureters or the kidneys. And as a result, we get hematuria, dysuria, hydronephrosis, 
and it's also the most common cause of squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder within sub-Saharan Africa. And identifying the eggs, they have the terminal spine on the ova, like a sting of a bumblebee. Manzoni lives in the lower GI tract with adult worms residing in the mesoteric plexus. Symptoms, think inflammatory bowel disease, you've got your colitis, your bloody diarrhea, your abdominal pain. And the spine on the ova is found on the side, like the dorsal fin of a fish. Treatment for both is a one-off dose, 40 milligrams per kilogram of praziquantel. These are some of the references that we used for the talk. Those that are interested in neglected tropical diseases, of which schistomiasis is but one, um, the Global Network website is very useful to have a look at. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. I hope it's been useful. Anyone have any questions, anything that's worrying them, feel free to contact me at the email address below. Cheers, guys. Thank you very much for listening.